Hello and welcome back to the channel. So today we continue with the book of Daniel, this time from chapter 5. Let's get started. So reading from verse 1, King Belshazzar, and we'll get into Belshazzar the king in a second. But King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem he brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. Then he brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple. The god of jo the house, sorry. Then he brought the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now, I'm going to pause there for a second. Daniel is a book that gets a lot of criticism from you know um, atheists and people who like to dispute the Bible and I mean the whole Bible does but Daniel in, in, in particular it there's a lot of criticism about when it was written there's a lot of criticism that everything in it is wrong and this started criticism and why did this start a whole bunch of criticism because when Babylon was rediscovered, when the archaeologists rediscovered Babylon, they found no, absolutely no evidence that there was a king of Babylon named Belshazzar. And they had evidence from the first king of Babylon to the last king of Babylon. So they stated that the Bible is wrong and there's a contradiction. Aside from that, Nebuchadnezzar only had one son who was a king and etc. And his name was not Belshazzar. So let's look at how the, Bi the Bible has basically made a fool of all of them and show them that it's the true ancient source. Right? So they state that Daniel was written just a, about a hundred years or so, maybe 150, 200 years before the time of Christ. And that all of it was lies so let's show how the bible is right and these people are completely wrong let's just go off and for a second and show that so we'll start with nebuchadnezzar all right now babylon did not start with nebuchadnezzar babylon as an empire started with nebuchadnezzar's father nabopolassa but let's start with, Bab with, with with Nebuchadnezzar he reigned from 604 to about 561 562 all right after Nebuchadnezzar was his son Amel Marduk he is referred to in the Bible as evil Merodach it's the same name it's just that evil Merodach is his name in Aramaic translated to Hebrew translated to the Vulgate translated to or transliterated, not translated, sorry. And Amel Marduk is his name from the Aramaic transliterated to English. So, but it's the same, it's the same name. It's just how it's kind of how it's pronounced in different language systems. So Nebuchadnezzar was um, you know um, succeeded by his son Amel Marduk. And he reigned from about 560, 561 to about 560. And in 560, Neriglesa became the emperor of Babylon. Neriglesa was not a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar Neriglesa was a general of Nebuchadnezzar who deposed and killed Nebuchadnezzar's son, Amel Marduk. And he reigned from about 560 to 556. Then... When he died, his son took over, Labashi Marduk, 
and he reigned for two months or thereabouts in the year 556 BC. And then after Labashi Marduk, he was deposed by Nabonidus. And in the history that has been recovered by archaeology, Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon. Well, while the term king is used in Babylon, and, 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 and Belshazzar would have been called king. By the way, Belshazzar was Nabonidus' son, who was made the crown prince. That came up after all of the foolishness. People keep digging the earth and keep finding stuff in archaeology. So it turns out that Belshazzar was Nabonidus' son. And while he was called king, he was actually more the king regent. Because for about the last 10 years, of Nabonidus' rule, he went off on whether it's excursion or, or, or conquest, but most believe it's an excursion. He, was, he thought himself as some sort of religious monk. So Babylon was in the care of the crown, or the, 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 the crown prince, who would have been called king, Belshazzar. Now, if Amel Marduk was Nebuchadnezzar's son, why is Belshazzar called the son of Nebuchadnezzar? Now the first thing, in the passage here and in most of the Bible, you may see son or father. It doesn't mean your son. It may mean a grandson, a great-grandson, etc. It means a descendant of or an ancestor of when you see son and father. However, Nebuchadnezzar's, some people would have thought that Nebuchadnezzar's line died with Amel Marduk, but it didn't. All right, let's see how it didn't. In fact, even Eric Lesser, to basically solidi solidify himself as king, Eric Lesser married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. But let us look, and by the way, you will notice the time periods between the end of Nebuchadnezzar to the end of the Babylonian Empire is not very long. It's not very, very long. It's not even a full 30 years. It's a little over 20 years. All right? So it's not a great deal of time. But let's see why Belshazzar would have been called the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So Nabonidus would have married Nitocris. And Nitocris was a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And out of the union between Nabonidus and Nitocris, we had Belshazzar. So the Bible, basically all those people who were stating that, hey, the Bible got it wrong. The Bible got it right. Aside from the Bible got it right. As we will see later on in this video, there was no way that some scribe in Jerusalem or wherever, a couple hundred years, could have known what was written in Babylon. Why was that? Because Babylon became a ruin. And it's only in the last 150 years people started finding out about the genealogies in Babylon, the history in Babylon, etc., etc. So there was no way we have worldwide communications, we have internet, and we... We, we have had newspapers. We have had printed material. We've had paper. We haven't had to deal with things as terrible and, and fragile as papyrus. And we have only, in this modern age, discovered some of these things in the last and been able to translate that information in the last 150 years. There was no way, absolutely no way, that someone in 150 AD or 200, sorry, in 150 BC or 200 BC, would have known what occurred in Babylon hundreds of years earlier. So, for this to be written in the book of, 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 of Daniel, the writer who wrote about this had to, become temp had to be contemporary during the time. And we will see why the writer had to be contemporary during the time. Keep in mind, Nabonidus is the last official king of Babylon. Let's continue. So, continuing from verse 2. Belshazzar, 
when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, you see the check by its father, that means his ancestor, right, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, be bought, that the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. Then he brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. There were many gods worshipped in, in, in Babylon. In fact, that's why it says Babylon is the great whore. All fake religions came out of Babylon. So, but not this incarnation of Babylon, an earlier incarnation of Babylon at the, at the tower. But all fake religions, as far as the Bible is concerned, came out of Babylon. So from verse 5, Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. By the way, this is, this is PG translation. If you read the, 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 uh, the original, right? If you read the original language, it's not that his limbs gave way. His loins gave way. He messed himself. All right? So the king saw a hand appear out of nowhere and out of nothing and sat right on the wall. So he, he messed himself. Hopefully he was wearing something that, you know, hid it a bit. You know, he, he just lost it. The king called, so from verse 7, the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed in purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler of the in the kingdom why the third ruler or the third in command of the kingdom because belshazzar wasn't the first in command belshazzar was the second in command there was no way that the writer could have known this unless he was contemporary to this time he had to be living in this time to know this He had to be living in this time to know this. Neb Belshazzar couldn't say, I will make you the second in command of the kingdom because he was in second in command of the kingdom. Nabonidus was the, 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 the king. He was the, cro the crown prince who would take over from Nabonidus, hopefully, when Nabonidus passes on. So all he could offer this person Yes, he's in charge of Babylon, but he's in charge of him while Nabonidus is not there. Is not there. He's the caretaker king. So he could only offer someone as a reward the third in command of the kingdom. Let's continue from it. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. Now, when they stated that they couldn't read the writing, that's not, a, that's not a correct. The writing was in Hebrew and they could read it. They just couldn't understand what it means because its meaning is weird. It's just a bunch of random words that we'll see. So let's continue. From verse 10, the queen, and by the way, this does not mean, the word queen does not mean this is Belshazzar's wife. No, this means the queen mother. This is Belshazzar's mother. This is Nabonidus's wife. This is a daughter. This is Nitocris, one of the daughters of Nebuchadnezzar, who would have known what occurred in Nebuchadnezzar's time. In fact, I'm pretty sure Belshazzar would have known what happened in Nebuchadnezzar's time, but these Babylonians, they got the big head. No, we are the most powerful in the world. And they keep doing rubbish. They kept doing nonsense. So, the queen, the queen mother, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. 
There is a man, again, we keep seeing the same thing over and over. They go to everyone except those who know Yahweh, the God of gods. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods or the spirit of the holy God. Holy means separate. The, the, it, it me, it, this is saying, the queen mother is saying, there is a man who knows the spirit of the Kadosh Elohim or the, the God that is separate or different to all gods. This is what, this is what holy gods mean. It's translated as gods because the word there is Elohim and Elohim is inherently plural. But in whose is the spirit, not the spirits of the Holy God. This is a little bit of a eh, not so great translation. But a lot of the translations can be here or there. When it, especially when it comes to, 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 to the word used, the Elohim there. So in whom is the spirit of the Holy God or the one of a kind God? The God that is different from all the rest. Who is the God that is different from all the rest? Yahweh. In the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans and astrologers because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar which is different from Belteshazzar let's not get confused whom the king named Belteshazzar now let Daniel be called and he will show the interpretation this daughter of Nebuchadnezzar learned respect you notice she calls him by his name Daniel God is my judge or God is the judge. She does not call him Belteshazzar. She said, whom the king, whom Nebuchadnezzar called Belteshazzar. But his name is Daniel. God is the judge or God is my judge. So you have a problem. Go and find this guy who is a servant of the real God. Who is a servant of the unique God. The God that is not like any other. The God that is greater than all. Let's continue. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed in purple and have a ring of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. In other words, keep it. Now, without skipping ahead to the book of Daniel, you'll see later on in the book of Daniel that Daniel, there was a prophecy that because of Israel's sin and rebellion, this prophecy was from Isaiah and Jeremiah, that because of Israel's sin and rebellion, they will be punished by God and be taken into exile for 70 years at first if they don't change their ways. And Daniel was studying, which is why we have to study the Bible. And Daniel was studying and he realized, wait now, the 70 years are up tonight. So Daniel stated, here we're going on, king. I don't want any gifts. Because in Daniel's mind, your gifts are useless because you ain't going to be king for much longer. There's going to be a regime change shortly. All right? So let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. All right? Don't give me no gifts. Don't make me the third, the third ruler. Usually, 
regime change comes with removal of heads i would prefer my head not be removed okay so i'll help you out i'll tell you what this means but you keep your gifts and your awards to yourself because you're not going to have them much longer okay nevertheless i will read the writings to the king and make known to him the interpretation and from verse 18 O king the most high god el elion gave nebuchadnezzar your father kingship and greatness and glory and majesty and because of that uh, because of the greatness that he gave him all peoples nations and languages trembled and feared before him whom he killed he killed whom he would he kept alive whom he would he raised up and whom he would he humbled but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him he was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys he was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high god rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will and you his son belshazzar have not humbled your heart though you knew all this so daniel is rebuking the king Daniel come in, he came in without fear and he decided to rebuke the king. You knew all what happened. You knew about this most high God. And instead of that, instead of humbling yourself before God humbled you, like how you had to humble your ancestor Nebuchadnezzar, you've gone and done worse. I'm not afraid of you because if you kill me now, I mean, you don't have long to live thereafter. But still, you knew all this. But you have lifted yourself, you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have you, have you, and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and bronze, silver and gold of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which you do not, which do not see or hear or no but the god in whose hand is your breath and whose are and whose are all your ways you have not honored now uh, uh, just a brief backstory the reason for this feast is that it was a holiday i can't remember which holiday it was they were celebrating one of their gods but while they were celebrating one of their gods they were under siege by an enemy while this celebration was going on there was an enemy outside the wall but they thought that their defenses were impregnable and to be honest they kind of were almost impregnable you could not at that stage break down and destroy the walls of babylon through simple force of arms without losing most if not all of your army babylon had very thick walls babylon was protected babylon sat on the great river euphrates and the great river euphrates was basically channeled through and all around the city so it was an impregnable and unswimmable moat so they were really trusting in their defenses right in the in the machinations that they had made in the defenses that they had created so while an enemy is outside they're thinking hey babylon can support itself under siege for 10 years you all could do what you want while you starve outside we're gonna drink and feast inside all right so daniel just rebuked the king let's continue then from his presence whose presence the most high the elion right from yahweh's presence the hand was sent and this writing was inscribed and this is the writing that was inscribed mini mini tekel and parson depending on the the translation you're reading you'll see mini mini tekel o parson 
all a person means is there's an and before it right so mini mini tekel and parson or tekel or parson right in hebrew you want to say and something you put a verb in front of it and you pronounce it and depending on what it is and what comes before it pre- pr- be pronounced with a vowel with a oop. so mini mini tekel or parson and this is the translation of the matter mini god has numbered the days of your kingdom and you brought it to an end Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Now you'll notice Daniel ignored one of the minis. Okay? And that's because this is what's called a dual prophecy. So there's a prophecy for the time of... Uh, there's a prophecy concerning Babylon for the for that time and there's a prophecy for a future time and that prophecy concerns Israel mini mini tekelu person it's and the the translation that Daniel used here was those using those words as verbs now there are some Hebrew words probably most Hebrew words they can be nouns they can be verbs they can be adjectives and let me give you an example in Genesis, the snake. When you read Genesis and you see the snake that basically fooled Eve and convinced Adam to sin, the word for that is neke, is nachash. Nachash as a verb is snake or the creature that hisses. Right? Snake, by the way, also means dragon a dragon is a snake interchangeable words at that time all right so the noun is snake the verb is to deceive and the adjective means shiny it's translated snake but is there any character any intelligent being in the bible that is described as a a a, a deceiving dragon a shiny deceiving dragon so we know that to be lucifer that's why we know it was lucifer in the garden because no one else is described or called throughout the bible a shiny deceiving dragon okay in fact lucifer literally means lucifer is the is the latin transliteration of 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 hillel right hillel ben shakar lucifer morning star right it basically talks about brilliance and brightness so <clears throat> daniel chose to use the verbs for mini mini uh, for mini tackle and parson right in this prophecy but there's another prophecy we'll deal with this prophecy now and there's another prophecy for the same thing that we will deal in a later video all right but for now Mini, mini, tekel, parson. Mini, as a verb, means numbered. Tekel, as a verb, means weighed. And parson or perez, it means divided. Okay? By the way, tekel is, I think, the Aramaic for shekel, which was the, the Israeli, unit, uh, Israeli unit of measure that was used as currency. In fact, it's still used now. It's been um, resurrected and used in modern Israel, right? Modern Israel currency is called the shekel. All right, but so as verbs, mini tekel parson, numbered, weighed, and divided. As nouns, it's going to mean something else, which we will deal with in a later video. But let's continue. Then, Neb- then Belshazzar gave the command. Didn't listen to Daniel. Didn't honor what Daniel asked. Then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler or the third in charge of the kingdom. Which kind of helped the Jews as we'll see in a later, <clears throat> in a later video. That very night. That very night Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed 
and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. So the army that they were, war were, were not concerned about actually broke into Babylon. And there was that army was led by Cyrus the Great. And they broke into Babylon. There was no fight. They took Babylon without a fight. And they deposed the king. And usually when you got rid of a ruler, you didn't leave them around to sow rebellion. You basically got rid of them permanently. So they got rid of Belshazzar permanently. They killed him. And Cyrus placed Darius in charge of Babylon. Okay? And this is the end of the Babylonian Empire. And it was ended in such a way because shortly thereafter this Babylon was destroyed. The records were lost and they were lost for thousands of years. Thousands of years. And by the time people are claiming that Daniel would have been written much later, there's no way anyone in Jerusalem or any Jew could have known unless they were living hundreds of years before. They could not have known 200 years before Christ what occurred in Babylon 500 years before Christ. But let's continue. Let's keep going. So, I stated that this is a dual prophecy. And the Bible is full of dual prophecies. But this is not the opinion of Wendell. This is not my opinion. I'll show you who basically validates that the Bible is full of dual prophecies. Okay, so let's look at a dual prophecy as an example, right? And the validation of the fact that dual prophecies occur and that the Bible is full of them. So let's look at Daniel 11. Yes, we're jumping forward and we're going to get to Daniel 11. But let's just take a peek at Daniel 11. And from verse 31. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate, or the, the abomination of desolation, depending on your translation. Now, this is a prophecy in Daniel that is speaking, well, it's a dual prophecy. But the first person it's talking about is a guy we know as Antiochus Epiphanes. And in 168 AD, Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Seleucid, um, ruler, a Seleucid king. Now, after Babylon, if you remember the Metal Kingdoms video, after Babylon, and that was would have been with chapter 2 when I did the Metal Kingdoms video, after Babylon, Babylon was replaced by the Middle Persian Empire. Then the Middle Persian Empire was replaced by the Greek Empire. At the height of the power of the the, the, the Greek king Alexander, he just died. He died at, at 31 years old. And his empire split into four. And one of those four empires was ruled by one of his generals called Seleucus. And the area that he took control of became known as the Seleucid Empire. And one of his descendants um, was named Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes was a part particularly evil man who suppressed and <clears throat> oppressed the Jews greatly and he did something in 168 BC that was terrible what he did he decided to place a statue an idol of Zeus in the temple in the holiest and he decided to sacrifice a pig on the altar and sprinkle that pig's blood all over therefore making everything in the temple desolate a pig was an unclean animal so if you put the pigs you sacrifice it on the altar you basically make the altar ritually unclean and you put the blood all over you basically has to have defiled or made the temple desolate so this is the abomination of desolation but it's a dual prophecy because we know it happened with Antiochus Epiphanes, but it will happen again in the future by someone who we like to call the Antichrist. 
we know it's a dual prophecy. But who basically is the first to claim that it's a dual prophecy? Let's take a look. It's not Wendell claiming it's a dual prophecy. Let's take a look at who else claims that this is a dual prophecy and that the fact that, and based on that, the Bible is full of dual prophecies. Let's take a look. And reading from Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, and it's Jesus speaking. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, by the way, what Christ is also saying here is you need to read and study your Bible. We see the desolate. When you see that, when, when you see what happens, that was written. So for you to know what's written, you have to read it. You have to study it. Okay. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. By the way, how are you gonna see? This is what a lot of us believe is a technology statement, a, a prophecy of technology. How are you going to know or see or understand that the abomination of desolation is standing or placed in the holiest? It's only one person used to see the holiest once a year. How are you going to see that? Worldwide communications. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand because he would have been studying. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the house top not go down and take what is in his house. Now, after what Antiochus Epiphanes did, there was a massive revolt. The Jews said, no, we're not taking it. So that kicked off the Maccabean revolt. And coming out of that, there was a, a, a festival where they... Um, rededicated the temple and all the implements of the temple and they lit the lamps but there was not enough oil to last for the period and the oil was supposed to go out all night and the oil lasted I can't remember how many how many days and that became the festival of Hanukkah now Jesus would have celebrated Hanukkah Jesus would have known the story so what Jesus is saying here is, yeah, the abomination of desolation took place in the past. It was a prophecy that took place in the past, but it points to once an event that's to come. So it's a dual prophecy. So it's not Wendell stating that the Bible has dual prophecies. It's Jesus stating that if dual, the Bible has dual prophecies. And if you are a Christian, you believe that Jesus is Yahweh. So it's Yahweh stating that there are dual prophecies. All right, so based on that, let's go forward. All right, so we're looking at one of the dual prophecies concerning Babylon. Now, in another prophecy in, in, in Jeremiah and Isaiah, God says that he will use Babylon as his tool to punish Israel and punish other nations. However, while God may use you to punish Sometimes you take it overboard, and the Babylonians took it overboard. The Babylonians, when they were um, defeating and breaking down the walls of Jerusalem, they were very brutal. They killed, they killed people and children indiscriminately. They were very, very brutal when the Jews stood up to them. So in Jeremiah 51, 24, it states, I will repay Babylon all by the way the dual prophecy was about mini mini tekel fasten right we will we we are, we are, we are dealing with that prophecy and its fulfillment in this video but we will deal with the other prophecy that speaks towards israel in a future video all right but let's continue with daniel 5. i will repay babylon and all the inhabitants of chaldea before your very eyes for all the evil that they have done in zion declares the lord Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so continue from verse 25. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, declares the Lord, which destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags, make you like a burnt mountain. No stone shall be taken from you for a corner and no stone for a foundation, but you shall be a perpetual waste, declares the Lord. So this is stating that because of the excesses of Babylon, 
and the brutality, the unnecessary, the unnecessary brutality, Yahweh is going to destroy Babylon and it will be a perpetual waste. Let's look at another passage. Right? So, Yahweh is going to destroy Babylon and it shall be a perpetual waste. But remember, I just stated that when Cyrus broke into Babylon, it was without a fight. So it was bloodless. Now remember, also, Babylon was built up and was a, a, a wonder of the world in that time. We hear about the hanging gardens of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had built a beautiful city. And no one wanted to destroy the beautiful city. But God said, I am going to destroy this city. Let's look at another passage, this time from Isaiah. And from Isaiah chapter 13 and, and verse 7. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes. And, da and, and in this passage, Isaiah is talking about Babylon and future judgment against Babylon that we see in chapter 7. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations or for all times. So, God had Jeremiah prophesy and he had Isaiah prophesy that when he moves against Babylon, he is going to have the Medes destroy, he's going to have the Medes come against them. He's going to have the Medes basically remove violently a bunch of people. He's going to have mass slaughter. And Babylon will never again be inhabited. He's going to destroy it, and it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a ruin for all time, uninhabited, uninhabited, and that's the judgment God pronounces. When God pronounces a judgment, it happens. So let's continue and look at this judgment that God pronounced on Babylon. By the way, in this particular chapter, I've seen a lot of people talk about this chapter and they focus on the handwriting on the wall because that's like a miracle. A hand appeared out of nowhere. And yes, that's miraculous. And yes, that's a spectacle. But I'm one of those Christian people who don't believe we should go off on spectacles. Because there are other people in existence. There are other beings in existence who could produce spectacles. And in Revelation, we are going to see the whole empire of wickedness produce spectacles. But there's a spectacle. There's a, there's a, there's a, 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 there are miracles that can only be produced and done by God. And one of them, by Yahweh, I should say, not God, by, by Yahweh. And one of them, right? One of them is prophecy. So, the devil and his kingdom can't reproduce prophecy. So that's why these prophecies is what I find absolutely amazing in this passage. Yes, all right? God prophesied to Belshazzar, and it happened immediately. Yes, there's a handwriting on the wall. That's fantastic, but this is even greater for me. So let me focus a little bit on this. That is so. This that is absolutely fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> right. So let me focus on this. That is absolutely fantastic. Okay. This is mind-boggling and mind-blowing. So we saw in Isaiah and Jeremiah that. Yahweh prophesied that Babylon will be destroyed. Okay? Let's, so let's look at the prophecies spoken through the prophets Jeremiah, 
and Isaiah about Babylon. Right? That God declared about Babylon. So the first one is that Babylon will be taken by the Medes. Alright? It will be taken by the Medes. Cyrus was a Middle Persian king. So Isaiah prophesied that it would be taken by the Medes. Daniel prophesied that it would be taken by the Medes and the Persians. It was. Cyrus's mother was a Mede. Cyrus's father was the Persian king. Cyrus eventually overthrew his father and became the king of the Medes and the king of the Persians. And when he took Babylon, he gave control of it over to Darius the Mede. So in, the, in this prophecy of judgment against Babylon, one, Babylon had to be taken by the Medes. Two, there will be some mass slaughter. There will be the Medes will perform mass slaughter against the Babylonians. The city, three, the city will be destroyed. All right? And four, it will never be re-inhabited. Now, when God declares something, it is done and dusted. But you will see that Cyrus took Babylon. Yes, Cyrus was the Medo Persian king. But he took Babylon without a fight. And later on in this video, we will even see how he took Babylon was prophesied. So he took Babylon without a fight. So there was no mass slaughters. He didn't destroy Babylon because they wanted to keep Babylon intact because it was beautiful. Right? And he wanted, they wanted Babylon to remain a major city. So, God declares something. And sometimes men have a different idea. But men's intent do stand. God's does. So, men did not want to have mass killings in Babylon. They did not want Babylon destroyed. And they want Babylon, wanted Babylon to, to remain a major city. It was beautiful. And obviously, it was wealthy. And obviously, it generated massive amounts of income. But God declared that it must be destroyed. The same way they mass killed people when they took Jerusalem is the same thing that will happen to them. And it will never again be inhabited. All right? So let's see how that goes. Because it looks like if God's word has failed. Because Cyrus took Babylon, yes. But he didn't destroy the city. He took it without a major battle. And the city was still inhabited by how many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. But let's see how this goes, right? So, in 740 BC, the beginning of Isaiah states that in the year King Uzziah died, that would have been around 740 BC. So, Dan, so Isaiah started prophesying in 740 BC. This is a couple hundred years before. And he prophesied during his time that Babylon will be destroyed by the Medes. I can't, I can't recall, I don't think Jeremiah said that it would be destroyed by the Medes, but Isaiah was the first to say Babylon will be destroyed by the Medes. Now, in the time of Isaiah, the great kingdom, the great empire would have been Assyria. And Babylon was destroyed by Assyria in 689 BC. It was destroyed by Sennacherib. Right? It was destroyed by Sennacherib. At the time, Babylon was a vassal kingdom of Assyria. And the Assyrians were explicitly brutal. Which is why God declared that he will wipe them off and they'll never exist again. And thus there is no Assyrian empire today. And there has not been for thousands of years. They were extremely brutal. So, <clears throat> they destroyed Babylon because of an uprising, right, under King Sennacherib. And we see Sennacherib in the Bible, right? He was the person who took the northern kingdom into exile. Excuse me. Yes, he was the person who took the northern kingdom into exile. So, he destroyed Babylon in 689 BC, but he rebuilt it. He 
he rebuilt it. And there were people, in fact, after the destruction, Babylon became bigger and it became even more beautiful. So he destroyed Babylon in 689 BC. Then in 626 BC, a guy by the name of Nabopolassar, who was the father of Nebuchadnezzar, he successfully rebelled against Assyria and founded the modern Babylonian Empire. Okay? Modern, of course, being 2,500 years ago, but the, 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 the great Babylonian Empire, right? What's called Neo-Babylon, right? He successfully threw off the yoke of Assyria in 626 BC, and Babylon started to rise as an empire. Nabopolassar. Then a little bit later, Nabopolassar, who was the king of Babylon, he allied himself with Syraxi or Syaxares, who was the king of the Medes, the king of Media, and they sacked Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. So they were the last nail in Assyria's coffin. And this happened in 612 BC. By the way, by the way, um, <clears throat> up to about 1840 or thereabouts, people who choose to disprove the Bible states that Assyria was a myth. It never existed. It never existed. They stated that no nation called Assyria ever existed. And the Bible is a lie. Until 1850, when archaeologists found Assyria and unearthed the great library of the great Assyrian king by the name of Ashurbanipal. And of course, after that, the Assyrians will state that something else in the Bible is a lie. But what I like is every time people state that this isn't true in the Bible, God causes something to be found. So for thousands of years, Assyria, no sign of Assyria was ever found. Until some archaeologists went digging in an area, they started finding little stuff. Then they found a treasure trove of stuff, which basically help them understand parts of the ancient world because Ashurbanipal had a massive library. And it again proved the atheists and the God-haters wrong. And would they, every time they'd be proven wrong, would they humble themselves before Yahweh? No, they'll just latch onto something else. But let's continue. So, 612, Nabopolassar and Syaraxeres, or, or Syaxeres, sacked and destroyed Nineveh and at that point Babylon took the lion's share Babylon forgot it had an ally and took the lion's share of what used to belong to Assyria and became this great empire then around 604 Nabopolassar's son who was out on campaign against Egypt and this was when he basically attacked and sacked Israel or actually the southern kingdom of Judah in 604 all right this was when he would have taken Daniel and the Hebrews this would have been the first exile all right when he was on campaign against Egypt for whatever reason the name of the pharaoh that he was fighting kind of slips me uh, name of the pharaoh slips me Right, but he would have taken over while he was on campaign against Egypt. He would have found out that his father Nabopolassa died and that he was the emperor. And he basically took the he some Hebrews into exile in the first exile before he eventually came back and destroyed the city after a rebellion. So, this is the timeline. So, you see, Babylon was destroyed in 689, but this wasn't the prophecy of the destruction of Babylon because it was done by the Assyrians. And God said in Isaiah that Babylon will be destroyed by the Medes. So let's continue and see what goes on in history. Sorry, the end of this video is all about history. Because if you don't understand history, you don't know how wonderful Yahweh is. And the fact that when Yahweh says something, it's done and dusted. It will happen. But let's continue. So, <clears throat> let's look at the timelines of Babylon. All right. Babylon as a great empire. So Babylon started under, or at least Neo-Babylon started under Nebuchadnezzar. But it became 
brilliant and wonderful under Nebuchadnezzar. So he reigned from about 604 to 562 or 561 BC. He was succeeded by his son Amal, Amel Marduk, who reigned for just about a year or two from 662 661 to um, 562 561 to, to, to 560 BC. Amel Marduk was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar's um, general Neriklesa. So Neriklesa killed him and took the crown in 560 BC and he would have reigned until his death in around 556 BC. After his death, his son Labashi Marduk became emperor. He did not last long. It states he lasted about two or three months. And then he was killed and replaced by Nabonidus. Nabonidus was not a descendant of, of um, Nebuchadnezzar, but he had married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter. And, Nabuc and Nabonidus was the last, last, last king of um, Babylon. While he, in the last 10 years of his reign, Babylon was ruled by his son in his stead because he went off on excursion. So in the last 10 years of his reign, it was ruled by the crown prince Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was killed by Cyrus the Great when the Middle Persians took Babylon. So we see the first part of that prophecy is fulfilled in 539 after it was spoken of by Isaiah sometime in the 8th century. Isaiah started prophesying. He started his ministry in 740 BC. And 200 years later, right, 200 years or so later, we see that the Medes took over Babylon. So, that's the first part. So, Babylon is taken over by the Medes, right? 200 years after, after Isaiah started prophesying. Isaiah started prophesying in 740, and in 539, we see that Babylon is taken over by the Medes. However, although Cyrus, although Cyrus took the city in 539, there wasn't a battle. So there were no mass killings. He didn't destroy the city. And there were people living there. So we know this prophecy is not complete. Let's look at the completion of it. So there is an inscription written on a cliff face in a town in Iran called Bisotun. And that inscription was made by Darius, a, a Medo-Persian king, right? And what it states that in 521, the Babylonians who were taken over just 20, no, a, little under, a little under 20 years before, rebelled against the Medo-Persians and they appointed their own king. And Darius's army, I don't believe this is a this is the same Darius. This is another Darius. Darius's army defeated the rebel army and captured Babylon. Then the rebel king and his supporters were impaled. And if you go, I'm not going to cover it because it's a lot of reading. If you go and read some of the sources such as Josephus, not Josephus, sorry, not, sorry, not Josephus, Herodotus and Xenophon, it said it was a slaughter. They slaughtered a whole bunch of people. And this was the beginning of slaughter. So who slaughtered these Babylonians? A Medo-Persian king leading a Medo-Persian army. After the city was taken, the Babylonians rebelled and a medo Persian king, there was a mass slaughter in Babylon in 520 or so BC. In 521 they rebelled and in 520 Darius came 
with his army and slaughtered them. Let's continue. So, we see that in 539 BC, Cyrus would have taken Babylon. So, the Medes took Babylon in 535. That's check one. That prophecy is fulfilled. Part that first part. The second part was happened in 520 BC that there would have been some mass killings. The city wasn't, there was some damage to the city, but the city wasn't completely destroyed as yet, but there was damage. And even after this event, people still remained in the city. So is the prophecy fulfilled? No. Let's continue. So, Yahweh declared, right? Yahweh declared destruction of Babylon as judgment. But men decided they're going to do something else. So I'm going to show here the destruction of Babylon by the word of Yahweh, despite the machinations of men. Because men did not want Babylon destroyed. Okay? So Cyrus took the city in 539 without a fight. He made great pains, and I'll get into shortly. Yes, sorry, this video is going a bit long. But Cyrus made great pains not to destroy or damage the city because the city was beautiful and the city was wealthy. And he wanted which king does not want wealth. So Cyrus did not want to damage the city and he did not want a major battle. And he accomplished that. But God stated four things we looked at the four things babylon will be taken by the Medes. there will be some mass slaughter of babylonians the city will be destroyed and will be never inhabited again men did not want this so cyrus took the city in 539 bc without a fight then after a rebellion in 521 darius his hoping i'm not butchering that name but i think i am darius his so that would have been a different Darius I believe Darius is Tapsis. he went he killed a bunch of people he destroyed the wall of Babylon and he carried off the gate so Babylon was no longer a walled and gated city and in the ancient world if you're not walled and you're not gated you're open to drama right so he carried off the wall he carried off the gate but he did not want to destroy the city but Yahweh declared destruction of Babylon. Men declared that we're not going to destroy Babylon. Babylon will forever remain a metropolis. But what stands is God's words, not men's intent. So in 520, Darius, his tapsies, destroyed the wall and carried away the gate. Then there was another rebellion. Yeah, the Babylonians were really into their rebellions. So there was another rebellion in 483. And this time, this rebellion occurred in the time of King Xerxes, who the Bible calls Ataxerxes or Ahasuerus. And in response, what did Xerxes do? Xerxes came, he destroyed the temple of Bel or Baal, as well as he destroyed a major part of the city. But he tried to rebuild. He, it, his, these things were destroyed not purposely, but in the fighting because they wanted Babylon to remain. So men still don't want to destroy Babylon, but the gate is removed in 520. And then in 583, you know, the temple of Baal is destroyed and part of the city right is is destroyed as well i think another name of of bell was marduk right so part of the city is destroyed then in 331 babylon fell to alexander the great the greeks came and alexander intended to rebuild babylon to its former glory he started putting all the the, 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 the resources in place to completely rebuild Babylon and make it restore it to its future glory. And right after he started, he declared, he made a royal decree that this is going to be done. 
this is he started to collect materials he started to put get his architects ready and let's rebuild babylon and bam he just died to this day no one knows why alexander died at 31 years old so alexander came in oh i'm the great king of the world um i could get everything done right i've ran over the world in just a couple years i'm the greatest that ever lived so i'm going to rebuild that um, babylon and i'm going to restore babylon and it's going to even be bigger than before but yahweh stated that yeah babylon will be destroyed and it will end up without a soul it will end up as a wasteland so alexander declared i will restore babylon and shortly after he was dead then in 270 BC, a Seleucid king by the name of Antiochus Sotar, he decided he's going to go even further. He declared that we are going to rebuild Babylon. And he started to collect materials and put all the logistics in place to build Babylon. And then war came upon him. So by 265, he was engulfed in this conflict, that conflict, until he was dead in 261 BC. He didn't rebuild Babylon. Sometime shortly after this, Babylon ended up suffering from a massive flood. Massive, massive flood. And actually became, for the longest while, for hundreds of years, it became a, um, a swamp. Marshland. At one point, the Greeks used it as a wildlife preserve. So it wasn't people living there. It was jackals. If you remember the, 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 the prophecy in Jeremiah, Jeremiah stated that the only people will, the only things that will inhabit Babylon will be jackals and wildlife. So for hundreds of years, it was inhabited, not by people, not even by Bedouins, because the Bedouins thought that this area was cursed. It was only inhabited by jackals and by, by wild beasts. Then, coming to modern times, after over 2,000 years, Saddam Hussein, remember him, he declared he's rebuilding Babylon and he started. He found bricks, he made bricks in the old fashion, he stamped his name on the bricks and he started rebuilding Babylon. And he, he came a fair way in rebuilding the city. But, how did that end up? He didn't survive very long after he decided to do that. And Babylon is still uninhabited. It's still empty. There was a documentary I saw a couple of years ago. They went into ancient Babylon. The only thing living there is wildlife. Men have intentions, but God's judgment stands above the intentions and the plans and the machinations of any man and this is the most magnificent thing all these prophecies this is the beginning by the way previously the whole book of daniel was about history we are now getting into prophecies so the videos may get a bit longer but this is what i see fantastic all right and let's look at something else in babel in in in, in this passage in this chapter that I find absolutely amazing. Let's continue. So, just to wrap this up, or at least this part of it up, the prophecies God pronounced against Babylon. So we saw that Babylon was taken by the Medes in 539. We saw that there will be some mass killings. That happened under Darius. I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name. <coughs> That happened around 520 BC. Then we saw that the, the city was destroyed. It was destroyed over a period of time, quite accidentally, until nature came and just wiped it out, mashed it up completely. No one could live there. Not even Bedouins, not even, you know, no one, no one, no one could live there. And no one has lived there for over 2,400 years. And it, no one will ever live there maybe after the coming of the messiah i don't know but it says that from age to age it will never be inhabited so everything spoken by the prophets by by isaiah 
and Daniel has happened. There is no Babylon. And it hasn't been inhabited for over 2,400 years or so. God's word does not fail. Okay? And let's look at the last thing. Let's look at... Let's look at how Babylon was taken. Because how Babylon was taken is miraculous as well. In Isaiah 44, Isaiah prophesies and he's prophesying judgment of Babylon. And it says, God says, Who says to the deep, Be dry, I will dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he shall fulfill all my purpose. Now remember before I stated, right? Before I stated that one of the key defenses of Babylon was it sat on the Euphrates and they used the Euphrates. They channeled all the waters of Euphrates as a defensive barrier. So no, you, um, no army has soldiers who have gills. So you can't march through a river. Right? You're not a fish. So they had not a little moats, but they had the massive river Euphrates. They had dug channels all around. And they used these channels to basically um, defend Babylon. They used these waters, these, this river, to defend Babylon. And in fact, they even had part of the river running through Babylon. So to get to where the where the rulers were where the king was there was even a massive river right just to get to the gate there was a gate over a river excuse me excuse me but so in isaiah 44 god says be dry i will dry up your rivers and cyrus he's my shepherd he will fulfill my purpose what's my purpose my purpose is i'm going to take babylon i'm going to remove and replace babylon as an empire Let's continue. Let's look at another one. In Jeremiah 50, verse 38, God pronounced a drought against her waters that they may be dried up. For it is a land of images or idols, and they are mad over idols. In other words, Babylon honors everybody but me. They honors the whole host of heaven but me because you can't honor me and then honor anybody else so what have i done i've pronounced a judgment a drought against her waters that they may be dried up isaiah 44 stated be dry i will dry up your rivers let's keep going forward in jeremiah 51 and verse 36 God is pronouncing judgment against Babylon again. The violence done to me and to my kingdom be upon Babylon. Let the inhabitants of Zion say, My blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea. Let Jerusalem say, Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will plead your cause and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea or her waters. Right? The word sea just means, it doesn't mean an ocean. It just means a big body of water. I will dry up her sea or her waters and make her foundation dry. And Babylon shall become a heap of ruins, the haunt of jackals, a horror and a hissing without, inhabitant, without inhabitants. We've already seen that for the last 2,000 plus years, the only things that have inhabited Babylon is wildlife. But... It says here again, I will dry up her sea or her waters and make her foundation dry. So let's look at a source that isn't in the Bible of how Babylon fell. So reading from Herodotus, and we could go on, you can do your research and read from Herodotus and read from Xenophon. When the siege of Babylon started, Cyrus came and stated there is no way this city can be taken with force of arms. The walls are thick. There was even a wall that went across a river. How are we invading this place? 
and reading an excerpt from the histories. Just to the west of the city of Babylon was a huge lake basin, some 35 feet deep and covering 40 square miles, but which at the time of an invasion was but a marsh. So there was an area just to the west of the city. It was a bit lower of this than the city and it was swampy. Right? Cyrus stationed soldiers at the point where the river entered the city and also where the rivers exited the city. And at a given time, while everyone in the city was focusing on their, 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 their celebrations and their holidays to their, to, their, to their gods who are not Yahweh, at a given time, he diverted the Euphrates from his bed into the marshy lake areas. His forces then entered Babylon under the city walls. Cyrus redirected the river Euphrates that was used as like a moat to, pro to, to protect Babylon. And his soldiers basically just walked into the city in the areas that were previously full of water. They just walked under the walls and caught everyone drunk and asleep and took over Babylon and killed the king, deposed the king. Just as God said, God stated, one, I'm going to use Cyrus and two, I'm going to dry up all the, well, all the rivers. How did Cyrus, how did Babylon fall? How did Babylon fall? Isaiah, who prophesied 200 years before, stated, I'm going to dry up the rivers. Jeremiah, who prophesied 100 plus years before, stated, God's going to dry up the rivers. What happened? Cyrus, read, Cyrus obviously Cyrus would not have known that Isaiah, nor Jeremiah. Cyrus diverted the rivers. The land became dry. And during the night, his army entered the city and took over the city. The Babylonians woke up and realized that the Medo-Persian army is in the city. And there was no fight, though the city was destroyed. So, that's the end of the book of Daniel, chapter 5. It's been a bit long, and some of the videos may get longer. But I hope you enjoyed it. As I stated... I did the first part of Mini Mini Tekel and Parson. In a future video, I'm going to do, or I'm going to touch on the prophecy as it concerns Israel in our time. Because many people who study the Bible, including myself, believe that the Mini Mini Tekel and Parson is a dual prophecy. One part dealing, one part when you read it as verbs, in the time of Belshazzar and Babylon, and one time when you read it as nouns in our time. Because if you read it as verbs, mini mini tekelu parson means numbered, weighed, and divided. If you read it as a verb, if you read it as a noun, it means kind of like bringing it into a modern. Um, modern reading if you read it as verbs and you translate it now it'll mean pennies quarters dollars and we'll get to that in a future video but I hope you enjoyed it look out for more uh, the, these videos are gonna keep coming okay um, many time at the end and I'm gonna do the little I can to help share knowledge to those who are interested in finding out about Yahweh, finding out what Yahweh has planned for us, finding out what the Bible says or what the Bible is trying to say. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. God bless. By the way, if you have any comments, you could leave your comments. I will eventually read them. All right. Thank you. God bless. Have a good day.